Hello, this is Michael Campbell, uh, founder of Glossica, and look who we have here uh, with us at our office in Taipei, Richard Simcott. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having um, me. To our offices here. How have you liked your stay so far? It's been fantastic. Yeah. Hello, everyone. It's been uh, what, three lovely days here in Taipei over yes. the weekend. And um, it was great that you met me at the airport and you've taken me around and shown me the whole city. And, and also, I can't believe how many things he's got in his head in terms of planning a trip around the city. It's, it's crazy, but amazing in a crazy, amazing way. And well, you well, can't possibly see everything, but no, at least not we, at can, we, can, we can go see a few sites. And I thought that, um, well, this year in particular, it's 2019 and uh, it's the beginning of the year and it was announced that this is the year of the indigenous language. Indeed. So I thought since you came to an island where there are many, many indigenous languages, uh, it might be hard to find places like that any, <laughs> anymore these days. But <clears throat> uh, yes, here on the island of Taiwan, you have a lot of indigenous languages and there you can actually go visit people that are not far from the city. So yesterday yeah. uh, I took uh, Richard down to Ulai. Ulai is a uh, an indigenous village. And do you remember the name of the um, the tribe? I know that the words and names might still be new. Ala, a, ala, Atayal. 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 There we go. So what what do you what do you find was one of the deepest impressions that you got from the uh, the Atayal village? Apart from the name, I could so easily <laughs> remember. <laughs> um, I thought some really interesting things were. First of all, you told me that they were headhunters. Yes. Which all, always sticks out, but it's nothing to lose your head over. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> the first thing. Yeah, they don't do that anymore. No, they don't do that anymore. Um, which is fortunate, because <laughs> I was looking around thinking. Whereas I think probably the, the other thing that stayed with me was the way they would weave into their patterns, their sort of um, clothing and design. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Stories. And they were actually letters and stories that were represented by what to sort of my naive and uneducated mind of that tribal language. Yeah, so we were, we were going through the museum and just taking a look at some of the things in there. And, and I mentioned that the, uh, you're not just looking at clothing or cloth here. You're looking at stories woven into the clothing. And that's actually a kind of a writing system that we don't really consider a writing system, maybe kind of like the Incan knots, yeah, you know, system exactly. where they, they record uh, events and things. Um, but this, in this case, it was, it's woven into the clothing. And so I don't know how to decipher it or read it, but it's, it's an interesting fact that that is a kind of a writing system. Yeah, because yeah. when you first see it, it's really reminiscent of some even Eastern European garments that it you is, see yeah. with these bands. Belarus, a lot of red. Belarus, Belarus yeah. really sticks out in my mind because in Belarus they have all of these very traditional um, ways of symbols within the, oh, okay. their, their sort of weaving. They even see it across the flag. Um, right, right. I don't know if that's one of the authentic ones on the flag today, but um, they definitely have them all the way through the country. There's a lot of diamond shapes on it. Yeah, right? yeah. beautiful. And they were very yes. similar to that. Yes. So I just thought, oh, it's a similar type of thing. But no. <laughs> Yeah, it might be interesting if other cultures also, uh, you know, because we do have emblems and we have shields and we have these things and across a lot of cultures that represent, especially in Celtic cultures, that represent, um, you know, a story of the family and its history. And so I think over time, uh, there's all kinds of different kind of writing systems out there, not just in writing words, but mm -hmm. also uh, shields and symbols. Yeah. So, do you know how many uh, tribes, uh, indigenous tribes, there are in Taiwan? I'm gonna guess a uh, five thousand two hundred eighty-seven. Oh, oh my goodness, not that many. <laughs> well, there are actually sixteen official recognized okay. ones, um, and so we, we visited one. And uh, besides those officially recognized ones, there are quite a few more that have disappeared over the years. But okay. still, some of the ancestors still. Uh, live around the area and sometimes you come across somebody and they say uh, yeah I'm actually my ancestors were part of a certain tribe that has already disappeared so some people they, they, they take pride in, in, in expressing that so and I saw when we went to your, your flat actually I mean I, I have a very stupid sense of humor sometimes so <laughs> I actually had more of a, an idea of the, num the true number but I didn't know the exact number um, but you've got a great map as well yeah these sort of where the, the tribes have moved even 
It's indicated the years they moved and were displaced around the island as well. It's absolutely fascinating to see. You've got yeah, so the, the migrations, it's not like, oh, the year 1750. It's yes. like 3,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. This migration happened because there's archaeological digs that can show you when it happened. But it's really impressive because when you think about it, the Chinese say their history is 5,000 years. But yet we can do archaeological digs and find that this tribe migrated 5,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago. Some of these things predate Chinese history. So we're talking about a really long history. That's, it's really impressive and I think these kinds of things about societies and about modern society, we look back, all of these beautiful, uh, rich cultures that make up the tapestry that we see today should really be preserved and it's, it was so nice to see that you know this island is at that point now where they're preserving them and, and really showing the respect right. uh, for, for the culture and the language by playing the music in yeah. museums and having a museum just dedicated to it just really really important and, right. uh, I think if we value that and we take and we learn from from the history of of these peoples, these very diverse peoples, I think we can only be stronger as a as a group of people. And there, there was something funny that happened as well. Um, <clears throat> I he was a friend of uh, a friend of Richard's actually joined us for the trip, but they were talking uh, with each other, and I overheard something. And you you mentioned the the little people. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe it was just a, you know, a joke about something else and I thought you were referring to something regarding the tribe and then I said, oh, you know about the little people and you thought I was joining in on the joke and I was being serious <laughs> and, then, and then I told you the story about the little people and you still didn't believe me. <laughs> no, he, he had to open up a, an article about it to prove on the On the phone yeah. I found, yeah, it, and today I brought something uh, and, and today, today I brought a book from uh, from the the Atayal tribe, and there's actually stories in here, and I and I had to I had to bring it and share it because there's actually um, there's all these stories in here of the of these tribal stories, and there's actually one in here of the little people. Now, do you remember what I told you about the little people? Like, uh, like what kind of a tribe, and and why why are they why they're called little people? Uh, because they came up to around three foot high. Right, they're about three feet high, yeah. And they had very dark skin. Very dark skin, um, right. And I think I remember from the story that we spoke about on the train this morning. And in, in a lot of cases, um, you have creation stories. And, yeah. and in some cases, you have extinction stories. And I think that in the extinction story, they might have to make up part of the legend mm -hmm. in order for it to sound plausible. But in this case, um, in this case, the Atayal tribes had never seen the little people, actually, or the dwarfs, they hadn't actually seen them ever eat. And they just thought that they, they consumed their food by trying to sniff out the, um, the aroma of the food that the Atayals were cooking, because they were always hanging around in the jungle um, surrounding them. So one day, the, the way that they disappeared, according to the Atayals, is the Atayals discovered that they don't have anuses. And so they, so they never eat, and so they, they never defecate. <laughs> so in this picture, in the story here, you can actually see all of, the, uh, all of them lined up, and then this Atayal guy here, he's getting a hot poker ready to, to give them all anuses, and that's how they died. So after he gave them anuses, they, they, all, they all died. But you know, the Saisia tribe, the neighboring tribe, they have a different story. Right. where um, it was just out of anger uh, between the tribes where they, they slaughtered all of the, the little people and now they have a ceremony that celebrates um, their existence because they taught them farming and things like this so they commemorate them. Um, and one of the tribes that I've studied, Thao, they have stories about the Xixitun, the, the little people as well. Um, but what's interesting is that you can still find these tribes existing in, in places like the Philippines. So you have the Akta and the Aita tribes in the Philippines that um, if you look it up, A-Y-T-A or A-G-T-A, um, some of these tribes still exist in the Philippines, but they're all, they've all disappeared in Taiwan now. So they have the, an extinction story. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I know which extinction story I probably believe most in terms of factual Sounding. The Saisiat one sounds Possibly, a little bit yeah. more. <laughs> yeah, the Saisiat one was kind of a more of a um, a violent story and a rage. Yeah, and they kind of got wiped out because of that. Yeah. 
Well, won't go into the details. Exactly, <laughs> not a very happy story, of course, but um, <clears throat> sounds certainly more plausible than the hot poker. <laughs> yes, this one sounds like it was kind of fabricated somewhere along the way. Uh, obviously, the people existed, but they didn't have an explanation as to how they disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> one of the most interesting things that uh, about Taiwan is the geological, you know, the, the actual scenery. Have you noticed anything about? Uh, yes. That is so mountainous. Um, yeah. I have no clue how how high the mountains were here. Um, you go sort of very short distances outside the city, and straight away you start climbing in whichever yeah. vehicle you're, you're in, whether it's a bus or a taxi or a car or a motorbike. In your case, yeah. more often than not, <clears throat> then you see that you you sort of you're going into this dense forest area with huge mountains and. It's really impressive. It's beautiful. It's actually quite. And impressive. seriously, you take ten steps off the road, you're already into primeval forest. It's it's quite. Um, it's very dense, and, and um, yeah. you have to keep fighting the forest away you know, to we, keep the city in place. <laughs> I mean, where we were as well. I mean, you know, there was a huge waterfall. It was yeah. Really quite quite nice to see. I think that um, one thing that you've noticed is. Uh, have you noticed a lot of Western people? Around around not town, so many, yeah. not so many Western people. You hear some Koreans and some Japanese, right? Um, and you see the odd um, kind of Western Western face. Um, more often than not, white Westerners. Yeah. Um, but but definitely, there's a couple, but not like you would imagine. I always thought that because I, I knew of you and I knew of, of Vlad. Uh, out here and I thought there were a number of other Westerners that moved out and I thought there was quite a big Western community here and yeah. really it doesn't seem, just on the face of it, obviously a few days there's not, Right. I, only, I can only sort of make assumptions, but it, it doesn't seem or feel that big a, a community. Yeah, because when you're in Hong Kong, you're walking down the street, you'll have South Asians, you'll have Europeans, you'll have everybody just passing by, same in Singapore, uh, just, just You'll see all kinds of um, nationalities coming and going in the mix. And I mean, one thing I'd say about it's about quite it's quite different here. It's more homogeneous. Yeah. It is, but in the same way, um, people's faces also are, are quite different, probably because of this mixture and this sort of interchanging of, of people from different parts of China. Right. Um, but you see really different features in people's faces. That's, yeah. It's quite interesting because sort of, you know. Physically, they're quite diverse. There's a wide variation yeah, yeah. of faces here. And yeah. so something you asked me yesterday was uh, whether ho uh, Hokkien and Taiwanese is the same thing. Yeah, because for me, it's always been a different thing in my head and you used it in kind of an interchangeable way. And I always, Hokkien for me is people and friends of mine that I've known from Singapore, yeah. they always used to talk about, yeah, we, we use Hokkien a lot in terms of the, the Chinese dialects but languages right and um, and and so Hokkien for me was always associated with, with Singapore so when you were using it uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of the context of, of here and and interchanging it with Taiwanese it was oh so is that kind of the same or different or you know and yeah so what's interesting is what we what we would call Taiwanese here in Taiwan is referring to the Hokkien language spoken spoken on the island and there's kind of like two different dialects but um, not really dialects I, I would say they're accents because everybody can communicate with each other and it's actually uh, you can communicate with people on, across the strait in Fujian so the word Fujian is the the Mandarin word for the province okay. but Fujian pronounced in Taiwanese is Hokkien uh, so Hokkien is the name of the province in its own language this is what we call an autonym Right, it's its own personal name for it, for the place. Um, so like we would say Atayao in English, but their own personal name is Utayan. They have their own pronunciation in their own language, or like German and Deutsch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, so German is English, but Deutsch is the German name. So that's Hokkien, is the Hokkien name. So normally, like people in Singapore, the way they speak is almost identical with the way people speak in Taiwan. So it's quite easy to go to Singapore and use Hokkien with them. There's a few differences, a few words, but it's um, it's more or less the, exactly the same language. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've I've been learning a lot really on this trip. I mean, for me, these are 
regions of the world that are so far removed <laughs> from my my life in, in Skopje. Uh, it took you a long time to get here. I mean, yeah, it takes it takes a, a lot while. of it takes a while transfers. To get here. Yeah, and it's not kind of a a place that's sort of in the forefront of people's minds, I guess. Right. And you know, it, it, back home. And but it's really exciting. It is. It's fantastic, yeah, and yeah. it's kind of a completely new world. It's such a modern, vibrant city with so many the old meets the new, and um, just it's a fantastic city to come and visit. I think. I think one of the greatest things about about Taiwan in particular is just the, the the level of the infrastructure and the technology and everything's brand new yeah. and I mean you use the uh, the metro system you know uh, you can you feel like uh, how, how do you feel about the metro system in comparison to other places it's fairly easy to use mm. having said that I managed to get on the wrong line this morning okay uh, <laughs> because they had the green line and the blue line on the same sort of level and I jumped right. on the wrong one and got the green instead of the blue. Right. But otherwise, yes, it's fairly easy and I think it helped me on this trip also having done some Chinese. Right. Because I can recognize some of the characters. Right. I, I'm far from being any good at Chinese, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but um but I can make up some of the characters. So some of the stations I, I do know when to look out for certain elements of the characters that I can recognize immediately. Right. So I'm not just reliant on waiting for the English uh, translation to appear yeah. and, and thinking, okay, and the doors open as the English appear, Jeff. You're still waiting no, for them. <laughs> will the doors close before I get to it? I don't know. So fortunately, I'm not in that position. Right. But I think do learn some Chinese characters before you make it here. Yeah. It, can, it can be a big help. Do you um, think it's a? It, do you think you have a feeling of a kind of overwhelm, a overwhelming feeling like it's so different, and it's if you don't know Chinese, it can be a really big challenge. How do you feel about that? I think it's good to know some, be familiar with some characters, um, it, particularly if you're eating. So if you go to any restaurant, learn the the character for raw, because for meat. Yeah, for meat, meat because yeah. um, it's very very easy to recognize. It's just kind of too. Um, People looking characters ran and then the sort of a box thing. That's what it looks like to me. It's kind of like a spine. Yeah, it's like a spine, exactly. With, with the meat hanging on the side. Is that what it's supposed to be? That's it's not really that, but <laughs> it makes better sense to me. Okay. Yeah. And here um, you just won't see any simplified at all. No, here it's really it's it's traditional. But some of the characters are the same. Yeah. Like Jong is the same. Yes. Um Hua I think is the same, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Um, and you'll see certain characters that even if you learn simplified characters or you've learned you learn simplified characters and for a bigger trip. Yeah, so uh, since this year is the year of the indigenous language, 2019, uh, we have an event coming up that you'd like to share with us. Yeah, definitely. So bringing the Polyglot Conference to Asia, um, I'm very, very pleased about that. The Polyglot Conference, if you haven't heard of it, is... It's, an, it's a conference I set up um, about seven years ago. So the first one was in Budapest where 140 language enthusiasts came from around the world, got together in a theater that we rented in the center of Budapest for a weekend to talk about languages, hear presentations on languages, and just break bread and enjoy each other's company. And it's grown since then. So year on year, we've got more and more people coming in, people who are learning their first language, their second language, the 31st language, you <laughs> name it, we've got them all. And they're all welcome because it's a really, really positive environment. People come away feeling infused. Yes. And they come out with lifelong friends. And there's always, uh, there's always somebody just like you who's on the same path that you are, that you can find and make friends with and connect with. Exactly. So we're going to be in Fukuoka from the 18th to the 20th of October this year. I think you said the name too fast. Uh, so the, it's a Japanese city. Can you say it again? Fukuoka. Fukuoka. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is a, a city located in this uh, on one of the southern islands of Japan. Indeed. Yes. So not too far from Taiwan. So we'll be uh, we'll be there at the at the conference. It's a it's a short distance for us. Thank you for bringing it to Asia. Well, thank you for coming and the <laughs> yeah. work you've been doing yourself with indigenous languages. Yes. Has been inspiring and impressive to me. Right. So. It's a huge honor to have you with us. Thank you us. very much. And um, really, really look forward to, to seeing you in Japan. Please come. So we'll be celebrating some of the uh, indigenous languages of the For region. Sure. I know Japanese has Ainu and yeah. um, some other uh, Japanese languages in the in the southern islands. 
Um, but there are a lot of uh, indigenous languages in Asia that we, uh, that we can talk about and, and share. Yeah, and, and really the conference celebrates the region and the area where it's going to be and it's going to be no different this year. In fact, it's going to be enriched by the fact there are so many wonderful indigenous languages and cultures available in this really wonderful region of the world. Really excited to be coming to Asia. But not only that, it gives you the opportunity to work on your, your Japanese specifically. And if you're learning another uh, East Asian language like Chinese or Korean, bring it to the conference, you know. Even um, because, Vietnamese. Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese Thai. Um, anything. Uh, bring, bring your East Asian languages to the conference. There's going to be a lot of Asian languages there. Um, we're probably not going to be using the indigenous languages anyway, but it's a, it's a nice topic to talk about. Um, but you can definitely get in, uh, start conversing with everybody there in Japanese, Chinese, and Korean and, and bring it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and if you're learning that language and you haven't been, this is the best opportunity for you to make the trip to East Asia and get in contact with the whole community. Thank yeah. you, Richard. Thank you for having me. <laughs> is there anything else you wanted to add? Hey, you could have a look at the Glossical website and see if there are any materials there. Yeah, any of the that's true. Local we, languages. We, we do have. Them, right? um, we do have a, quite a number of East Asian languages, and we also have Mongolian. You know, so it's one that's overlooked a lot. Um, but a, a lot of the we have several Chinese, not dialects, but individual Chinese languages. Um, we've got both Southern and Northern Vietnamese, Thai, and uh, Filipino and Indonesian. All of these will be present at the conference. Um, wow. So this is great. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, this is Michael Campbell, the founder of Glossico. If you love languages as much as I do, then you have to subscribe to our channel, or else you're just missing out.